A therapist uses virtual reality to enter the mind of a serial killer in the hopes of finding his latest victim before it's too late. Join us as we discuss the greatest movie soundtrack of all time, viruses that cause schizophrenia, and screensaver special effects. Then we find out if the cell stands the test of time. Time. James and Alan have their say Do the movies you love still hold up today? James says gladiator with a glut Alan says as a father blah blah It's the test of time James and Alan have their say Do the movies you love still hold up today? Test of time James and Alan have their say Do the movies you love still hold up today? Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Test of Time. My name is Alan Noah, and joining me, as always, is my buddy and pal, James Brief. Hey, how you doing, everyone? I'm excited for our third week of our Spooktober series of podcasts. Uh, Today, we're going to be reviewing uh, 2000's The Cell, starring uh, Vince Vaughn, uh, Vincent D'Onofrio, and Jennifer Lopez. I think it stars Jennifer Lopez. I think she's the uh, the top build. Yeah, I was just trying to do a little a little bit of alliteration there with the uh, V's. Um, I guess I got to do on Jennifer Lopez and then Vince Vaughn and uh, Vincent D'Onofrio. Yeah, I, I think she does get uh, top billing, and and yeah, in uh, two thousand, uh, I think she would get top billing. Yeah, I definitely think so. And this is, I'm pretty sure, the first Jennifer Lopez movie we've done on the podcast. I think I had out of sight on the list, but then we didn't do it for some reason or another, right? Is this the first time we're talking about a Jennifer Lopez movie? I think so, yeah. Okay. Well, Jennifer Lopez obviously is an actress and a singer. And a dancer. That's true. But that kind of leads me into this thing that I saw the other day where Rolling Stone put out a list of the 101 greatest movie soundtracks of all time. I'm a sucker for these kinds of lists. There are a lot of movies on the list that we've talked about on the podcast, plenty of movies that we haven't yet that I would very much like to. But, James, the number one soundtrack on this list is a movie that we have done on the podcast. So, here's the game. You get three guesses, and you get three questions. You can ask any questions about what we said, what we thought, when the movie came out, things like that, and then you get three guesses. I don't know how challenging that'll be, but I feel like you always play these kind of games, so I wanted to quiz you on something. All right. Is this soundtrack primarily known for one artist and by artist i mean either a person or like one band great question and the answer is yes okay is this from the 80s yes Hmm. i'll tell you that my initial guess was that this was uh the bodyguard the bodyguard starts the list at number 101 so it is on the list but the very very top of it Oh, wow. Okay. All right. So it just barely made the list at the uh, 101st. Yeah. Okay. That honestly is fair because I can only name that one song. I, well, I think I could think of one other song from it, from Whitney Houston. I'm Every Woman. That was, yeah, that was a, yeah, a yeah, big yeah. hit. You got some other stuff there. But all right. So an 80s song. Oh, I still got one more question, right? Yeah. 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 You have one more question and three more guesses. You haven't used any of your guesses. Is the entity mostly or primarily uh, female? No. Okay. What were you thinking of? You know, that's actually a bad, bad question because I don't really know what that might have been uh, staring me towards, <laughs> to be honest. All right, you know what? I'll give you another question. We okay, won't count yeah, that, that one. That was, that was a bad question. All right. Use that information, but you will get another question. All right. So, so far, I have got a male or a mi- primarily male band uh, mm-hmm. led single one, uh, single soundtrack. Uh, I mean... I don't think they're going to go with uh, Flash Gordon with Queen. I mean, that's possible in retrospect. 
I mean, we didn't review that movie, though. Yeah, that's right. We didn't review that movie. Um, the Big Chill and, you know, some other, like, uh, Flashdance. While those are big soundtracks, I don't think they're primarily known for one band. True. And uh, Dirty Dancing, I mean, it's got two songs. So I guess that, you know, you got several hits from that from that soundtrack. That's 74 on the list. Okay. Um, well, is it... 80 to 85. Yes, it is. The first half of the 80s. And that's your last question. Now you get three guesses. Is 9 to 5 80s or is that 70s? Uh, that is the 80s. I believe that's 1980. 9 to 5 is from that that movie. Yeah, right? but I don't think there was anything else on that soundtrack. Right, right. So it may not be. Okay, so yeah. um, I don't really have anything. I'm, I'm kind of blank and sorry. You're going to have to give me a hint. Okay, all right. I thought you were going to ask more questions about us on the podcast. Like, when did we talk about it? Did we like it? I will answer those questions for you. This is a movie that we talked about on the podcast this year, in 2024. And you and I both said that the movie did not stand the test of time. So those are two big hints. Oh, I think I got it. I think I yeah? got it. Yep. What's is that? it... Uh... Purple Rain? It is. Purple Rain was number one on the list. It's a pretty great fucking album. It's short. I think there's only nine tracks on that album. But yeah, that's a pretty solid album. It's a pretty solid soundtrack. All of those songs were new, were written for that movie, Especially because we just talked about it. I was like, oh, I got to tell James about this. Yeah, I mean, it's not something I would have picked. Uh, I mean, I always respected Prince. I, I like a song or two of his. But, uh, you know, you don't have to love something to appreciate that it's necessarily good. It's just not your taste. That actually is a, a good segue into The Cell. Because at the end of last week's episode, you said that you hadn't seen this movie, but you had heard good things about it, right? It's just one of these movies that either in online discourse or in passing in a comment section, once in a while you hear about The Cell and you hear anything from it's not that bad to, oh, that was a cool movie. So I was just curious about the film for a couple of years. And then we had our Spooktober. And I wasn't even sure if this film qualified as a horror film, but um, I kind of thought maybe it would. So I suggested the film. I guess it's debatable if it's horror. Definitely suspense. And there are some horror aspects of it. I think it's fine for Spooktober. We can have some leeway with our definitions, I think. I think the film kind of has like four genres. It has the horror film genre. It has the sci-fi film genre. It has mm -hmm. the crime mystery. We got to solve a mystery by finding clues uh, uh, genre. And then it's got your homicidal sociopath serial killer like in saw or some kind of trap and you know there's a race against time uh, thriller it, it's got all those elements in there yeah but for anyone who hasn't seen the movie the cell it's about Catherine dean played by jennifer lopez a psychologist who's using an experimental type of virtual reality therapy to enter the mind of her patient edward a boy in a coma Meanwhile, a serial killer named Carl Starger, played by Vincent D'Onofrio, is kidnapping, torturing, and murdering women. Just before Carl is caught, he enters into a coma similar to Edwards. That's a problem because he had just kidnapped another woman, and FBI agent Peter Novak, played by Vince Vaughn, is determined to find her before she's killed in Carl's cell, an automated chamber that fills with water. Peter asks Catherine to use her VR tech to enter Carl's mind and find out the location of his last victim. Inside Carl's subconscious, Catherine finds two versions of Carl, a boy who is abused by his father and a powerful monster who relishes harming women. The adult Carl captures Catherine, and Peter uses the VR machine to enter Carl's mind to rescue her. While there, Peter finds a clue that he uses in the real world. But Catherine is determined to help the child Carl, which she does by reversing the machine and bringing Carl into her mind. There, she kills the adult Carl, which also kills the comatose Carl in real life. So this movie came out in 2000. I really don't remember it at all. How did it do at the box office? Uh, 
I remember this film coming and going. This $35 million budgeted film came out on August 18th, 2000. It opened at number one with $17.5 million, on its way to $61 million domestically, so almost double its budget, and $104 million worldwide. I believe this film was probably profitable, although it didn't make a sequel until it made a direct-to-DVD sequel like uh, many years later that had nothing to do with this film. Okay. So I went into this movie really blind. I knew nothing about the movie other than Jennifer Lopez was in it. So I was just along for the ride. And that's fun sometimes. I I enjoyed that. But I have to say, I was really surprised out of the gate when we see the serial killer And he's torturing women. And then we see Vince Vaughn and uh, Dean Norris as uh, FBI agents. And they're going to catch this guy. They're doing their police work. They need to hurry because he's kidnapped another woman. But then they find him really fast. I didn't write down the number of minutes into the movie, but it's pretty damn quick. And I was like, oh. I wasn't expecting that to happen so fast. You're right. They, they do catch him right away. And I was surprised. However, it does make sense with the plot. But where they figure out, ah, we cross-checked uh, the white Ford Bronco with this albino dog hair that we found. Uh, you know, that's the kind yeah. of thing you find late in Act 2. Yeah, normally that happens later in the movie. In this movie, it happens early in Act 1, which is... Yes, you're you're absolutely right. Happens because of the plot mechanics of the movie. And, you know, these are FBI agents and they are good at their job. I mean, they're doing good old fashioned police work. But then they hit a snag because he's kidnapped this other woman and he is in a coma. And so they can't get that information. So then they go to this out there concept of the VR therapy to go into the mind. And, you know, we've already been introduced to Catherine and she's doing the same thing. So then it's like, okay, now I get why you captured the guy right away because he's comatose and that's the whole thing. But that was the first surprising thing that happened in the movie. Not the last, though. Yeah, I knew that there was something along the lines of maybe VR or going into dreams or something like that. Um, I was thinking of one film, and you must have thought of the same film at some point. What film were you thinking of, Al? I was thinking of The Lawnmower Man. Oh, oh, I was actually thinking a completely opposite film. I was just thinking Inception. Oh! Uh, Inception, not to go too much in that film, there's a group of people that need to get a secret out of somebody. So they have to go into that person's dreams, so they put that person to sleep, and then they can go into his mind and subconscious mind to try to get a a secret out of this person. It's a very similar uh, concept here in The Cell, where we have a serial killer that has a secret, and or a you know, some information that you can't get out and we have to go into his mind. If they redid it today, it would be some kind of AI slash nanobot slash whatever, you know, techno babble that you need to update it, you know, to today. They never really get into the science. They say what it does, but they never really try to even say anything about uh, the the real science about it. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah, they kind of yada yada a lot of that away. They do talk about the virus that Carl has, which is also what Edward, the the boy patient, has, which puts you in this comatose like state. I mean, that's that's bullshit. That's fiction, right? When she first said a kind of virus that kind of eats your brain, I was thinking she was actually talking about something called a prion, which is this horrible, horrible, terrible disease. Um, the, the, one of the famous ones, uh, yeah, the, the nickname Mad Cow Disease. Uh, this was like 20 okay. years ago. They're sort of alive and they're sort of viruses, but they kind of get into you. And if they do, you're basically dead. So I think thought that's what this was um there are illnesses that will cause mental illness um uh syphilis famous 
mostly. Uh, it's called tertiary syphilis, which you get many years later. I don't know of a virus that specifically causes schizophrenia. There is probably a virus that can mimic the the symptoms of it, probably. So okay. yada, yada, yada. Uh, these people both have a virus. I personally thought that that was a little bit irrelevant, even though I guess it's because, yeah, if you can use it to get through to this person's mind affected by the virus, you can maybe get through to another person's mind affected by the virus. I just didn't think they needed to say that either person was uh, affected by a virus. I just think this is brand new technology and they just didn't know how to yet crack into the mind. Fair. And so kind of going back to Edward, the, the boy, when the movie starts, she is trying to connect with him and get him out of the coma. But there is a boogeyman named Maki Lock that he is afraid of. And that's preventing Catherine from really reaching him and getting him to come out of his shell and to come out of the coma. And that boogeyman, Maki Lock, is named and then dropped completely. Once we get into the Carl plot, there is a scary demon in his subconscious. But the thing with Edward and Maki Lock, it is just abandoned. The character of Edward is just completely gone after Act 1 until a sort of coda at the very end of the movie, which apparently was a last-minute addition that was not going to be there in the movie. That scene is supposed to take place in Catherine's subconscious, but it looks exactly like Edward's subconscious from the beginning of the movie because that's the footage they already had, and they just kind of added some flowers to it to indicate that it was her mind. But it's weird. It's a weird device that they use to kind of set the stage, but it really doesn't come back in any significant way at all. First of all, I want to say I love when I learn these film terms from you. So uh, that's called a coda. I would call it a coda or a button. I feel like I, I've called it a button before. Just a little thing at the end of the movie that is there to just kind of wrap up some loose ends and leave you feeling like, oh yeah, everything's fine now. I think coda is uh, technically a music term, hmm. but I think you could use it in this context. Well, either way, this addition at the end, I think it is a fantastic positive to this film. You're right, while they don't explain who Maki Lock is and they never get back to any of that, I think that last five seconds really, it's supposed to imply that her attempt to reach Edward is successful. Yes. That's why I believe the fade to white is. So I think all the Maki Lock stuff, maybe everyone has their inner demon. Like Carl has his abusive father. And maybe everyone has something. You know, everyone's had a, a traumatic experience. There's a, there's a line that Catherine says when she's telling uh, um, uh, Vince Vaughn's character, Peter Novak, which is a great name for an agent, I think, by the way. Agent Peter Novak. She asks him, you know how there's a part of you deep down that only you know about and you never tell anyone else about? And Novak says, I think all of us have that part in us. And she says, well, I get to see that part of people. You know, when someone wrongs you, there is this primal urge, the, I want to kill him. But of course, then there is the sense, I, don't, I forget which one it is, the ego, super ego, the id. One of those is the part that says, no, you don't murder someone because they cut you off in, in, uh, in the line of the supermarket uh, or whatever it is. I think that Catherine's saying that she gets to see everyone's Maki lock, uh, but I, I wish they put a line in there that explained that. Like when she's talking about Carl, she should have said, This is just like Edward. He has his Maki lock, and I think his Maki lock is his dad. Well, you bring up something interesting there, which is we see Carl as a child and Carl as the adult who kills women. And I think that's really interesting because what the movie is doing is showing you that this man who is a killer, a torturer, a, a sadist, like a real fucking sick human being, he started off as a little kid who was abused. And Catherine feels bad for him. And the other movie besides The Lawnmower Man that I was kind of thinking of while I was watching The Cell was Silence of the Lambs. And Carl is kind of 
Buffalo Bill-esque, you know, where he is really just deranged and he's torturing women. And in Silence of the Lambs, Buffalo Bill is the bad guy. Period. Full stop. And that's fine. Like, that makes sense. He is he is a, a monster. So is Carl. The shit that he does to women, which you see in the beginning of the movie, is fucked up. He doesn't just kill them. He, like, mutilates their bodies. He turns them into dolls. He masturbates while watching videos of them drown. I mean, he is fucking evil. Like, this is fucked up shit. And you can hate him for being all of those things, for being a monster. And you can also feel bad for him when he's just a victim of child abuse. Both of those things can be true at the same time. And I was like, okay, this is interesting. I I like how this movie is going into some pretty fucking murky territory here. This is not black and white. This is gray. And I was really hooked by that premise. But I think the movie drops the ball here where it doesn't make it gray. It has black and white. Kid Carl is good and sweet and innocent and you feel bad for him. Adult Carl is the monster and you hate him. And there's room in there to explore that more. But I don't think the movie does a good job of really delving into that. What did you think? This is not kind of a time travel film. This is one Carl. There is the personification of him as an innocent boy. I think it was very well cast as this really, really sweet looking boy who's just like, you could sense his fear of his father and and kind of the innocence. But I I almost, uh, I disagree even with the title you're giving the other guy, the adult Carl. That guy is kind of this like demon Carl. And uh, the, I, we have not really talked about Vincent D'Onofrio, but oh my God, I, if you're going to pick a creepy guy, Vincent D'Onofrio has done some fantastic killers and he is a creepy, creepy guy when he has to be. I don't know if you've ever seen Full Metal Jacket. Have you seen that? Album? Yeah, of course. He is a creepy guy in that film. Uh, he is fantastic as Kingpin. Um, oh, yeah. Vincent D'Onofrio is a fantastic actor. This adult demon, Carl, he's the personification of almost like a devil and a homicidal maniac. Uh, so I don't think there's necessarily like any good part of that guy. This is more like... Uh, the character of Darth Vader as that guy in the black cloak. There is a little bit of that innocent boy, Anakin Skywalker, still in him. That's what yeah. I think that uh, that Catherine's saying. This is not trying to get you to forgive him. I- I'm very happy he dies at the end of this film. The world is a better place without this guy. Well, yeah, and I think the fact that this movie shows you more dimensions of this villain is really interesting. And to me, the thing that was really intriguing was you have this abused boy and he turns into this monster later in life. To me, the question is, when does that happen? How does that happen? Where does that line exist? And the movie doesn't answer that. It does not go into his villain origin story. It doesn't show you the thing, the moment where he changes. And that's okay. I don't think the movie has to do that. No, this is not trying to be Joker. Yeah, I mean, that's fine. To me, that was a interesting place for the movie to go. And the movie doesn't go there. It just kind of keeps these two aspects of Carl distinct. And it does feel unsatisfying, especially because Catherine is resolved to help Carl the boy. After Peter gets the information he needs, he's out of there. But Catherine's like, I need to save Carl the boy. And the way that she quote unquote saves him is by talking to him and then killing adult demon Carl, which also kills boy Carl and the real life comatose Carl. So she doesn't really save boy Carl. You know, boy Carl dies just like the other Carls. What did she really accomplish there? 
So I was thinking about that a lot since I saw this film a couple of days ago. And I've come to a conclusion that I don't think she was ever trying to save Carl. I think she was doing the that entire thing as an experiment uh, to see if she could save Edward. Really? She was doing the entire reversal thing. I don't think the billionaire was going to let his son be the first person that they were going to test going into his mind. Oh, okay. So I think that she decided to do something radical and uh, lock herself in the room and do something that was never going to be allowed. This is not her billion-dollar machine. This is, uh, I guess, this secret lab that they never really talk about. But she does say to boy Carl, I'm going to come back for you. I promise I'll come back for you. I mean, her motivation for saying that could be self-serving, but I didn't get that read from her. I thought she was coming back because she genuinely wanted to help this scared little boy. Who the fuck is she going to save? It's a, it's a it's a guy in the past. Uh, you know, this is a boy that doesn't exist anymore. This is the personification of the good boy in him. Again, I mean, it's almost like there is a little bit of Anakin Skywalker in him. But, I mean, if you're talking from a religious point of view, sure, she can kill that demon and then uh, maybe he could be saved. But uh, I don't even think so because it's not like Carl is asking for forgiveness it's uh the little boy that's uh, you know scared of the uh, uh demon guy i want to dig into that religious aspect though because the movie has a lot of religion and religious imagery it's not subtle one of the things that we see of carl being abused is at his baptism where he is held underwater for too long and he feels like he's drowning and then he comes home and his dad beats him. And, you know, a a baptism is supposed to be a wonderful rite of passage, but it was this traumatic moment for him when Catherine does have adult Carl, demon Carl in her mind at the end. She shoots him in the hands. He's in the crucifix position. She's dressed as a nun. He's saying, save me. Like, there is a lot of religious stuff layered on this story, which is fine. But again, I don't feel like it goes anywhere. It feels like it's religious imagery for the sake of religious imagery. It it, it feels perfunctory to me. Like, it doesn't add anything other than just a thing you can point to and say, oh, like Jesus. Like, why? Why is he like Jesus? How is he like Jesus? He's he's not Jesus-like in any way. So the religious stuff just felt, like, unnecessary. You know, I didn't really notice too much Christian religious allegory, honestly. I mean, it kind of felt angelic, as if inspired by, you know, your kind of renaissance. Uh, this is what a dream world or the afterlife might be. Okay. Well, let's go back to Peter. So Peter goes into Carl's mind, he rescues Catherine, and then he sees this image, this symbol in the subconscious mind, and then it triggers a memory of something he saw at the crime scene, and he's like, oh, that must be important. So then he leaves Carl's subconscious, and they start investigating the symbol. Come the fuck on. This is the second thing that really surprised me in the movie, but this surprised me in a bad way. These guys are clearly good investigators. They found Carl based on a dog hair and some paint chips. That's impressive. No one thought to investigate this symbol on this piece of equipment and say, hey, what's this symbol? Where does it come from? Oh, it was made by this company and the company hired a guy to dispose of their equipment. They figure all of this stuff out with real police work, except the clue kind of came from the subconscious mind of Carl, but also not really because it was fucking there. It was there in the real world crime scene Peter saw it in real life. What the fuck? Like, all of this VR stuff is completely unnecessary. Um, no, I, I disagree. I think the VR work uh, is necessary because of the time constraint. I think what you're saying is is a valid criticism about, hey, the clue is there. And I think they would have gotten to that eventually. But as we do see, once they find out, uh, once they see that clue in VR, he sees it and he goes, hey, that clue, that thing that is like, an hour and a half away by helicopter, that's where we have to go immediately to save this drowning woman. 
Yeah, but how much time did they lose going to this VR facility, begging Catherine to to do it? They go into Carl's mind three times. I mean, this is time consuming. Fine, but it's more like this symbol is all over his mind. It's like inscribed everywhere in this in this one room. In one room in his subconscious. Yes, I mean that that's one of the only rooms that Peter Novak sees. He also saw the torture equipment in Carl's home. It's inconsistent because they're good cops in the beginning of the movie. And then they become Keystone cops later when they overlook this this one thing. I agree that in retrospect, could they have gone there earlier? Yes. But I think it's reasonable that this like one little thing they find in passing does not immediately send the APB that it ultimately does. Maybe, but... From a movie perspective, from a storytelling perspective, it's fucking bullshit. Because if he's going to get something that's like an important clue from this guy's subconscious... It should probably be a brand new clue. Exactly. It should not be a thing that he saw at the actual crime scene and it just jogs his memory. Right. It should be the code to the lock or something. I get it. It's the password to stop the gas or whatever it is. Yeah. I, I get it. That that would have been a little bit of a, of a more obvious MacGuffin. Now that you completely analyze it, I'll give that to you. Yeah, but I, I still think it just gets them to the clue quicker. But I, I agree. Something that they couldn't have figured out earlier would have been better. Fine. Yes, exactly. Another movie that kind of came to mind while I was watching The Cell was Face Off. Because both of these movies have completely out there premises but the good guys have to use these premises because there's no other choice and face off there's a bomb and this guy is i think also in a coma or he's not talking or something so we have to switch faces that's our only choice and in this movie it's like well we can't figure out where this woman is so we have to use this vr therapy to go into his subconscious it's our only choice and I get it. That's the point of the movie. That's why the movie exists. Understood. But I think if you're going to do something like that in a movie, you really have to sell it where there is no other fucking option. I don't think that makes sense in Face Off, and it definitely doesn't make sense in this movie because these are good cops, because these are good investigators, and because the VR thing leads them to something that they should have just fucking seen in real life anyway. I, I get it. I get that. That's a valid criticism. Um, there is a part where Catherine, she becomes uh, she becomes trapped in within the world of the VR, and she's trapped by Carl. So Peter has to go in as well and then rescue her. And in order to break her from her trance, uh, he's told that he's going to have to tell her something deeply, deeply personal. So he screams to her something about the death of her brother when she was younger. And of course, that's going to be, you know, she's going to think of her brother and suddenly snaps out of it, and it works. But I read that uh, originally he screams at her that uh, when she was in college, she had an abortion and right. that caused her a great emotional turmoil and test audiences, uh, they had mixed reactions to that. I agree. It's a completely unnecessary thing to, to break. It'll break the fourth wall and make people start thinking of an election and Supreme Court and, and a protest they saw. I really don't think you should be talking about abortion in a film that uh, does not need to talk about abortion. Uh, so I think that was a very good choice, in my opinion. I think that was probably true in the year 2000. It's definitely more true in the year 2024, just two years after Roe v. Wade was overturned. And people have very strong opinions on that one way or the other. It's such a polarizing topic that it's not worth it to just mention it in passing. If you want to make a movie about abortion, go for it. There have been many, many great ones, but you need to treat the topic with respect. It's a it's a weighty right. issue. Exactly. And uh, yeah, it, it, it should not be used in passing. I agree. Um this was a heavy special effects film. Um, what did you think of the special effects, Al? They were pretty good. Some of them looked like they were trying to show off. Specifically, I'm talking about the moments where Catherine and then 
Peter go into the subconscious where you're supposed to be seeing the descent into the mind and all of the lights and lines and circles and geometric shapes and things like that. It's fine. Going back to the lawnmower man, it was a better version of that. A, a lot of the, the special effects in that movie were very polygony. Uh, so this is a vast improvement, but some of it looked kind of dated. I thought these special effects are wildly inconsistent. I thought that some of them were almost laughable little, like, it looked like a screensaver of little, like, flower petals appearing, like, in the corners of the screen. Yeah, there was some screensaver -y stuff. Yeah, it looked like a little gold trim was slowly creating, a, like, a picture frame around, uh, around the movie at one point, and I thought that was a little laughable. Yeah. There was one image that has been in my mind. I think it's going to stay there for a while. Just a fantastic scene. Like, they cut this horse... 30 different ways and then separate it so then they're able to walk between these slices of the horse and every part is still moving like the lungs are still inflating yeah i thought that was an absolutely beautiful shot um demon carl when he's walking in this throne room with a with a big velvet cape that's basically the uh back curtain of the whole room i thought it's a beautiful scene uh, i think a lot of the scenes are well done in a you know you're in a dream kind of sequence and i typically do not like dream sequences and i was able to tolerate this because i think they were just long enough and they actually did have enough logic to them that i was able to uh follow them i don't like when they're completely alice in wonderland and everything just is dreamlike but i thought that the special effects generally were pretty cool. I didn't think there were any special effects that were so bad that I was like taken out of the film, but I was able to go, yeah, th th this has gotten a lot better than, than what we're seeing here. Yes, I think that is very, very fair. But let me ask you, James, what do you think about the movie as a whole? Do you think The Cell stands the test of time? Um, I have to say that this film surprised me. Uh, I, I actually was skeptical. I had heard a couple things that it was kind of neat. When I first saw the first five minutes, I have to say the only word I could think of was like, oh no, like art house pretentious. It like starts out with like <laughs> a horse like jumping in the desert and I'm like oh god what the fuck is this and i'm also thinking oh no al's gonna kill me if there's 90 minutes of this because <laughs> you know i have no idea what's going on but uh you know quickly i think the film got to the point of what it was and after that i, I thought it was an interesting film and in the end i'm gonna say this is a really decent, underrated film. I think the director, our Tarsim Singh, I think he did a, a really nice job with this. Um, you know, I had known some of his uh, work, and I'm sure you had known some of his stuff. He had done um, one of the most famous uh, videos from probably, I would say, the peak of MTV. You ever see the video for Losing My Religion by R.E.M.? Of course. So he's a very artsy guy. I think the uh, cinematography in this film uh, was very good. The plot a little bit dives down towards the end. It's not quite as interesting in that once Peter Novak solves the crime, I didn't quite get why she keeps going after Carl because I don't really care about saving Kid Carl. But the very last coda at the end of the film, I really think uh, was pleasing to me because it's not the best way to have ended the film, but it was five seconds that are clearly telling you that this reversal will work once again and Edward's going to be okay. So while I think that the film is not perfect, I, I think it's an entertaining film. I, I think uh, Vince Vaughn actually was surprisingly good as, a, as just a straight-up FBI agent. Uh, Jennifer Lopez is good. Vincent D'Onofrio is very good. The guy Dean Norris um, from Breaking Bad, he pops up. And, you know, he, he plays, once again, a cop. You know, he, yeah. he, he's great in that role. So, yeah, I, I mean, it stands the test of time. It's not something you need to see over and over again. But I, I thought it was a fun thriller. Um, what did you think, Al? Does the stell stand the test of time? I did not like this movie as much as you did. It really intrigued me with a lot of the questions that it was asking, but it doesn't answer any of them. And that's really frustrating. 
I think there's something in here. I think there's a way to take a fucking evil monster and show you how he became a monster. And that could be really interesting if it's well done. I haven't seen it, and honestly, I have no desire to see it. But there's a new show or movie on Netflix about the Menendez brothers, I think. From what I've heard, that kind of tells you their backstory and why they killed their parents. And some people find that off-putting, and you know, some people are intrigued by it. I, I think there is a desire for those kinds of stories. I think those kinds of stories can certainly stand the test of time. There's always going to be fucked up people who kill people and, you know, exploring why they do that is interesting. And it can be done in a way where you don't justify what they've done, but it lets you understand how they came to be that kind of person. And if this movie had explored that about Carl, which I think they were trying to, then... It could have been interesting. It could have been a really good movie, but the movie just kind of falls apart. You don't really understand Carl. You don't really care about him. I really didn't care that much about Kid Carl. There also weren't any stakes with Kid Carl because, yeah, you want adult Carl to die. There's no way for young Carl to live because he is connected to Carl. He is part of Carl. So what can happen to him if maybe there was some aspect of the VR where the innocent kid Carl could live on in a simulation or something? Okay, sure. Maybe I could root for that. Or maybe audiences wouldn't go for that because he's part of this killer. I don't know. But I just felt like the whole movie really comes apart. And also just the conceit of going into this killer's mind to solve this mystery, it doesn't work because it just reminds Peter of this clue that he saw in real life, which Officer Dean Norris really should have investigated, and they could have figured it out, and they could have saved that poor woman with more than just seconds to spare. So I don't think that the movie stands the test of time. Also, yeah, I know the Oculus is a thing, but... I do think it was more of a 90s, maybe early 2000s thing where people thought that VR is going to save us all. It's going to unlock our future potential as humans. Now that's kind of what they say about AI. I think VR is like now considered a cool way to play a video game. But, you know, we don't have that that weight attached to it that was kind of present 20, 30 years ago. I think VR will have its heyday once it's not a bulky headset. They'll get there. Once it's the size and weight of regular sunglasses, um, and it's more of like probably augmented reality rather than VR, that'll be the breakthrough. But um, I think that this film is, a, it's, I would almost say it's a weaker Inception. It's so funny that you mention Inception. You're totally right. It does have a lot of similar DNA with that movie. I was just hung up on The Lawnmower Man and Silence of the Lambs. And I was like, this movie is if those two movies had a baby. And then I was kind of workshopping The Lawnmower Lambs, Silence of the Lawnmower Man. In Lambson. Silence of the Lawnmower Inception? Inception Man. Silence of the Inception Man. We'll workshop this. We'll get a whiteboard set up. We'll we'll figure this out. We'll crack the code. But that's going to do it for us this week. Next week, we are going to finish up our Spooktober season with a Halloween movie requested by my friend Tomek Rose. We're going to watch Wishmaster. Have you ever seen Wishmaster, James? I saw this a long time ago, and I even remember seeing Wishmaster 2, colon, Evil Never Dies. Ooh. Which is why there's two other sequels after that, because Evil Never Dies. Okay. Well, I have never seen Wishmaster. I'm looking forward to talking about that movie. Until then, please write to us. We are at Test of Time Pod on Facebook, X, Instagram, and Threads. Let us know your thoughts on Jennifer Lopez and Vince Vaughn and Vincent D'Onofrio and virtual reality and exploring your subconscious. Whatever, whatever you want to say. We do love hearing from you. And we'll see you next time, everybody. Bye. Bye.